live or watching the recording or whatever, whether it's morning or afternoon or night or whatever. Um, so I've got a very interesting chat today. Um, something that is maybe a little out of our ordinary stuff because it's not directly related to beer, but it is fermentation. And I think you're going to find some of this is some very interesting findings because I have with me Kim Suwan from the Georgia Institute of Technology. And he's been doing some research on traditional kimchi fermentation, which um, traditional materials that are used in that, which I won't get into here because Suwan is the expert on this. So he's um, he, he's agreed to, to spend a little bit of time just telling us about about his findings. And um, I'm kind of excited to, to see what the what comes out of this. So um, thank you, Suwan, first for, for taking the time. Yeah, I'm glad to have this session. Uh, hello, I'm, I'm a second year PhD student in Georgia Tech. I'm studying mechanical engineering here, uh, especially some fluid mechanics about like uh, animal locomotions, like insects, animals. So I'm working with uh, Dr. David Hu. He's also doing a, a lot of lectures for publics. You can uh, search his name and you can find a very interesting talk about like mosquitoes, water striders and uh, now uh, I had a, a small project about ongi which a fermentation vessel for kimchi and now I have uh, Brian here uh, to introduce some of my research today. Um, yeah so maybe what we maybe I can ask you first for people who don't know I I have a vague knowledge kimchi is obviously it's a fermented cabbage that has as I understand mm -hmm. it's you know, it's very important in Korean culture, as I understand it. But I, um, it's been around that's for true. Long. So we, uh, Korean, most of the Korean eat kimchi every day. We, we do, we do have a container to store kimchi in our refrigerator, and actually, we, in the Korean household, they also have a refrigerator only for kimchi. We call this kimchi refrigerator. And like in that much, they we are kind of obsessed with uh, kimchi as an ingredient as itself. Also, we put the kimchi in a very different types of cuisines. Okay. And it's so, a, basically it is the main ingredient is napa cabbage, or it's called Chinese cabbage, and we have salt, uh, and sugar uh, to ferment to ferment kimchi to ferment the cabbage, and we have some minced garlic, ginger, minced onion. Sometimes we put minced minced rice as well and we put uh the powdered red pepper and we put some anchovy fish sauce and mix all of them we make kimchi okay and okay well, well maybe so kimchi obviously like i said it, it's been around for thousands of years i guess but let, let's maybe if we start going a little bit backwards if that's okay so today you can probably i presume you can get it like it's a commercially available as a finished product and people are also making it themselves at home um yes and those so would be the fermentation say in the commercial one is probably in what stainless steel or something like that yeah uh i have no chance to look at like what what's going on in those kimchi factory but i believe they're all like still container yeah. and at home because it's... nowadays yeah nowadays just traditional pots are not suitable for them because it's very brittle and expensive the shape is round, so yeah, yeah. I believe they do uh, some fermentation. The ferment, the big fermenting tank, which made of some stainless stainless steel or something. And at home, I think I read that it's um, people who do it at home are using glass or plastic. Yes, and sometimes we use that uh, the earthenware, the ongi. So they do still use some of that, okay? Because that's where I was going back towards. Um, <laughs> so the idea that. Most aficionados, I don't know, most people would say that the modern, say, fermented, commercially one fermented in stainless steel or even the ones that people are doing at home with maybe a bit more love and a bit more care, they still don't taste the same as those made in traditional pots. I think, so this, there's some scientific evidence that two kimchi, I mean, one kimchi from the stainless glass, one kimchi from ongi are different in its contents. And it is something that uh, my paper also revealed. But uh, I'm no, I, I haven't seen anyone can actually can, can differentiate between two kimchi. Okay. Actually, uh, 
after I published this paper, uh, what the one reporter from Washington Post reached out to me, and we also talked, and she uh, published an article about my research. And also, I found that she reached out to some kind of famous uh, Korean chef in America, working in uh, in New York. Uh, he, uh, she's called Mang Chi. Uh, uh, he's kind of famous in SNS, I guess. And he, she actually did a kind of small task, inviting his her friends. And he, she prepared two kimchi prepared from just a plastic container and kimchi from the ongijar. Actually, he, she she owns several ongijars there. Okay. So uh, they they did a blind test, and she uh, she found out that like not many people can actually see the difference between that two kimchi. Okay, so okay, so that's interesting because I I had understood that. Yeah, maybe it's just people who are really into it or people who think they can tell a difference. Maybe, maybe super sensitive people may can differentiate it, but I think most of the people has no that uh, sensitive sense, maybe. Okay, okay. But then, obviously, the materials are different. So stainless steel, glass, and plastic, they're not mm -hmm. permeable. They're not, they don't have any, any way of doing that. Whereas what you found is the ongi pots, which are these... Well, they're different different sizes. Let's maybe first talk about what an ongi pot is. Is that they're different sizes, but they're clay pots. And from what I read, they're kind of specifically made. Like they're they're not like a porcelain porcelain china. They're that they have certain characteristics. So they're maybe you could just just tell us what a, what they look like or how they're made, um, and then we go back. So basically, it looks like a round shape, which is very round color. And if, if you take a cross section area of the ongi, the ong, the cross cross section area is also a brown color, okay. and also the difference between the some porcelains, uh, is that the porcelain is almost impermeable, so the difference is in coming from the its ingredients. So basically, to make the por so porcelains, they do have a rigorous filtering process. So having only fine particles to have a ingredients of the pottery's but for the ongi they use very kind of the range the size size range of those ingredients is very wide they don't do a, like rigorous filtering they only just pick up some big petals and just he just they they just uh, slap it the model slap it the mud and make it a big uh, piece of it and since the particles are very different in size they have kind of small gaps between it and during uh heating up like around up to like 1200 celsius degree and cooling down very slowly like for a day and that generates some special pores uh, which gives a kind of spe uh, special characteristics of the ongi which is very porous and you can see very fine holes there if you take a look at it in the microscope and the size is around one to 100 micromillimeter one micromillimeter is uh, one over 100,000 meter. Right. So, yeah, so so they're quite small. It, it, it's not really visible. To, to the naked eye, it looks like a smooth surface. Yes. Um, yeah, it, it, it looks like smooth surface, but, but you can... the Also, the porcelain surface is very smooth, but the ongi surface is quite, quite wild. It's kind right. of like rough, actually, compared to porcelain. Okay. Um. And are these, these aren't glazed or anything, are they? Uh, actually, they do glaze as well. Okay. So some, some ongis are glazed, but some, some ongis are not glazed. Uh, but the glazed makes the ongi less permeable. Yeah. Because glazing making, a, it, glazing is adding a new liquid film in the inner and outer surface of the, the container, uh, which make it, uh, which re reduce its permeability. So in my experiments, they, uh, I chose an ongi which is not on, which is not glazed. Okay. But 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 the glazing is good for uh, using it for a long period of time because if if it is not glazed, the surface is too rough and it can be eroded so easy. And also some food or some residue from the last use usage can uh, stay there because the sur surface is too rough. So I think the. Glazing is more like uh, increasing the use 
usable time of the ongi, but it actually decreased the permeability of ongi. Okay. Um, actually, that, that'll, I'll, I'll come back to that because there, there's something you said there that's interesting. So, so maybe the, you can tell us, so um, I'm trying to figure out which, which question to ask next. <laughs> the, yeah, so maybe I'll ask you first, the, the fermentation that takes part, that takes place here in kimchi, um, what, what, what's doing the fermenting? Is it a yeast? Is it a bacteria? Where does it come from? Um, and how does it get there? It's lactic acid bacteria for okay. the kimchi. So it is different from, actually it's a similar, but slightly different from beer fermentation. While beer fermentation is using yeast to do fermentation, but the the food fermentation like cheese, uh, like uh, yogurt. I forgot the the German version of kimchi, sauerkraut. Uh, brat, yeah, sauerkraut. Yeah, th th yeah, those fermentation foods are uh, using lactic acid bacteria, which are naturally residing in the soil. So which means they just naturally live in the our raw ingredients like cabbage. So we yeah. don't need to have a another source to get the lactic acid bacteria when we ferment food. There is a lactic acid bacteria in the in the ingredients we bought in the supermarket. If you put some salt, which they like salt, and okay. we put that in for a longer period of time in uh in good temperature they like, they do fermentation. And and they after they get uh full refrigerated like they they get pr porous and they generate some CO two and the CO two is a signature of sign uh, that they're doing the fermentation. Also, since it's lactic acid bacteria, they produce lactic acid make which make that food more acid. So you can see some sour taste as well. So yeah. that's why most of the uh, fermented food are kind of sour. Yeah, so probably a lot of people became more familiar with this during all the, the COVID when suddenly sourdough was, everybody seemed to be making sourdough bread everywhere. So this is this is exactly the same bacteria, the exact same production of you know CO2, and it's the exact same process with the exact same, same bacteria. Yeah, yeah. So while then, yeast, while yeah. yeast producing ethanol, as a finer byproduct, but the lactic acid, lactic acid bacteria produce lactic acid as a finer product. That's the difference between yeast yeah. and lact lactic acid bacteria. But then, and that's why, well, I'll just bring it back to beer just for a second. That's why kind of spontaneous beers like Lambics, that, that's why they're sour because they're a mixture of the yeast and the lactic acid that's coming in from the, the atmosphere. Um, oh, so I see. Yeah. Uh, like just if you're not sure lambic it's um it's a spontaneous beer so what they do is they cool the wort they've just put it into this narrow kind of well shallow sorry shallow mm. um what they call a cool ship and leave it outside mm. and the yeast and the lactic acid from the air basically start to ferment and that's so it's, it's the same thing really um except that the that's kimchi, interesting yeah no it, it's um it's a fascinating beer fascinating beer type <laughs> Very big around Brussels, um, but um... Uh, actually, I like beers. I like like exploring different beers in the brewery because there are a lot of beer, brewery in Atlanta. So, is every sour beers or lambic beer then? No, no, lambic are no? the spontaneous okay. ones. You get other sours that people add. Well, they add they add the lactic acid themselves in the kettle. Oh, I see. They're kettle sours, but the. Uh, you know, they'll add a yogurt or something like that into it. But um, mm. the lambics are the spontaneous ones. So they're generally considered a bit more complex. And then they go into barrels where they ferment further. And the yeast is kind of, there's yeast in the barrels and that, which, you know, is kind of reused as well. Um, and that produces. And then they they mix different, you know, different um, vintages. So one year and three year and all of this. And it, it's it's a fascinating, fascinating beer style. Um, and then a the, lot of mixture with fruit then as well in with it. Um, but it's the same, it's basically the same process as kimchi. So, but in the kimchi, you, like you said, you add salt and I presume then, is there any yeast um, 
taking part in that? Do you know, or is it just purely the lactic acid bacteria that's that's doing the fermenting? So the ingredients I use is the cabbage that I bought in the supermarket. I believe they're maybe so lactic acid bacteria is naturally reside in the soil, and that's why we have lactic acid bacteria in the raw cabbage. But I'm not sure uh, if yeast is living in the soil. Does yeast is living in the soil? It does. Um, it lives in the air anyway. Um, that's where oh, it's in the lambic. So I mean, I mean, but bacteria is everywhere. So yeah. I guess some portion of the yeast is in my cabbage, but yeah. I made up a condition that la that uh, the lactic acid bacteria will proliferate uh, the okay. condition they will like. So that is my salt, my salt and temperature. So yeah. if I control the those conditions like temperature or some kind of chemical that yeast likes, then they will proliferate and it is more like I can make a some kind of ethanol from the cabbage, maybe. <laughs> yeah. But that's not what you want. Um, okay, so yeah, so, <laughs> so just, just to be clear, so what we've established here is that you they take the cabbage, don't add anything to it, put it in the pot, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. then just add any some salt, um, which presumably kills off any of the yeast that would be there and is loved mm -hmm. by the lactic acid bacteria, and then it's left to ferment. Um, yes. And what you found is that the the conditions of the ongi, the the you know the, the roughness, permeability. Extent, permeability, all of that mm -hmm. actually helps support the the lactic acid. It creates in the the environment that it loves as well, um, and that seemed to be doing a lot to do with the permeability and the gas coming out and wicking stuff in. So you might go into a bit of bit of depth in that one. Yeah, uh, because if the if the jar, the fermentation 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 jar is impermeable, uh, if it is hermetic, there is a pressure buildup inside because the from the fermentation they keep producing CO two, and actually the pressure is high is become very high in like such hermetic glass jar, so it seems like I think that it is not my part. I, I didn't look up this. This closely, but it seems like the lactic acid bacteria doesn't like those high pressure and okay. high carbon dioxide condition. But the, the what Ongi did, what Ongi is doing is that they uh, constantly emitting out those CO two, but still there's a small bit up. But they maintain that internal CO two level lower than hermetic glass jar, and. That's what the lactic acid, lactic acid bacteria is favored. And they like those conditions and they proliferate more and they produce more lactic acid bacteria, lactic acid. And they, the, the, the bacteria count, the number of their, uh, their population is much higher than the one in fermented in the hermetic glass jar. Right. And there was, and that's all coming out as the gas is coming out as a CO2, because I remember just briefly looking at the articles on it, their salt comes out as well. And you were finding salt kind of condensing on the outside of the jar, were you? I think, yeah, that's true. But I think there are two separate story. So what I'm talking about is salted cabbage. Okay. Uh, for the for salt is coming out from the outer surface. It's more like, uh, like soy sauce, which is much more salt. So like mm -hmm. for salty water and the... If I put this, so it is between the salty water inside the ongizer and the salted cabbage inside the ongizer. When, when I put the salted cabbage there, there's no salt coming out. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So okay. like, so, so other than kimchi, we do fermentation for like soy sauce, which is also a big part and a very useful ingredients for a, a lot of cuisines. And we, and that's, that soy sauce is very salty and it's basically like a salty water. And since the wall of the ongi is porous, if you put the water inside and the water is kind of flow through those small pores, okay. it, okay. Is, 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 it is driven, driven by the surface tension of this liquid. And they slowly flow through the uh, pores and they reach out the outer surface and they evaporate. But the only water evaporates and that's why they leave the salt crystals behind. And we can see the salt crystals outside of the war. 
and that oh. happens for the fermentation fermentation of some of those salty liquid. But for the for the kimchi, there's not many water there, so okay, I, I, kind of I, different. I, it's a, it's a, in the kimchi fermentation, the gas is commuting between those pores for the 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 soy sauce. This liquid is passing through those pores. Right. I I kind of combined those two into one, and I mis <laughs> misread the thing. So <clears throat> so the main thing you think you're you're thinking on this is that it's th does this speed up the fermentation then because it's the the you know because the environment is so good for it does everything ferment much faster i presume than in a stainless steel or a glass tank yeah that's what my paper showed so the the co2 the amount of co2 they emit in the same period of time is uh the, the, the lactic acid bacteria in Ongi uh, produce around 30% more CO2 than the lactic acid bacteria, I mean, the cabbage in glass jar, which we presumably say the, the, the population of lactic acid bacteria proliferate more than in the, the population in glass jar. Right. And how do you, sorry, this is a, a strange thing, but how do you know when, when kimchi is finished fermenting? Is it, what are the visible signs? Oh. How do people know this? I think, first of all, I can taste it. Okay. Because like I mentioned, the fermented food has, has some kind of sour taste. So uh, actually, Korean people eat kimchi right after they just mix it. That, there's no, even though it is not fermented yet, we do it. And actually, some people like those kind of not fermented kimchi as well. So we can differentiate those distinct difference in taste like the fresh mixed kimchi versus fermented kimchi and the from fermented kimchi we can uh, taste as a sour taste and we can say the fermentation is over but the ferment we can stop the fermentation okay even though we eat kimchi and put that put, put it back to the refrigerator that will keep fermenting but okay. as you go fermenting that we can see some it's difference more. in color as well but in, in a scientific way, uh, in my experiment setup, it's because I installed some CO2 sensor and pressure sensor. And like after two or three days, they reach out to a kind of steady number because they initially increasing due to the increased activity of the bacteria. But they, uh, they just stay in a steady plateau there. And they're kind of equilibrium, what they're emitting what uh, the CO2 they emitting and the CO2 the, the ongi jar is emitting. And I think I would say that the two or three days is enough to ferment those things and they reach out to a kind of steady state. Okay. okay. Actually, two or, two or three days kind of short period for fermenting food. I mean, it is because I did these experiments in very high temperature. Like I did like 25 Celsius degree, but okay. people do not usually ferment food in that high temperature. We do ferment food in low temperature, which increase our time windows that we can eat those foods. Okay, okay. So that's yeah. a deliberate thing or is... Yeah, so, so that's, do you think that's deliberate because people just do it so that they can, they, they can preserve that for longer? Yeah, to preserve longer. Okay, okay, I didn't know. Never thought of that. Um, I think, I think, Speaking speaking about like preserving longer, there's a kind of one tradition in Korea, like when there's a uh, no fridge invented yet, but we do from food, we do add kimchi back there. And there's a kind of custom in the in the winter when we make a kimchi and we make a big big hole in the ground and we put that ongi jar with kimchi. Inside of the inside under the land, okay. which keeps the temper temperature is higher than atmosphere in the winter, yeah. so that we cannot we so we can preserve longer. If you put the just ambient air, they will get frozen. But if you put the underneath the land, underneath the ground, then we can preserve longer. There there is a lot of uh, ideas that, that to preserve the food longer. <laughs> Actually, that, that sounds like what I mentioned to you before these, um, also in Georgia, but in the other Georgia, the Kave, 
I can't pronounce it, Kvivivivri, which um, yeah. about, I only came across these recently, but for anybody who well, who doesn't know, but seemingly in Georgia, it's a tradi- traditional thing for making wine. They have these big, the, the same, big. Big, same pots, huge ones, and they ferment the wine in the ground in that. And I never knew in that before, but it sounds mm. like it's doing exactly what you're saying. No, obviously there's yeast involved in that, but and that this is probably outside of your your thing, but it, you know it keeps the temperature the same. Yeah. So the yeast, presumably, it's a good temperature for the yeast as well, and they produce CO two, mm-hmm. which comes out through the the thing as well. So presumably, they're yeah, it, it's doing exactly the same same job. Yeah, actually, yeah, and I've never heard about this Cavalli uh, in Georgia. I think it's it looks very similar to Ongi. Besides yeah. its size, its size <laughs> is huge. Yeah, they were. For anybody who doesn't know, I mean, I, I, like I said, I only came across them recently, and they're they're bigger than a person. Like they are taller than they're huge things. Yeah. But seemingly, it does exactly like that. They bury them in the the vineyard, and then they just mm-hmm. stay there for presumably generations, and you know, until they break down mm-hmm. sometime, and they just re-ferment the wine. Um, which brings me back to actually the the glazing thing. You were saying one of the, like obviously glazing. You said it makes it less permeable, so presumably it's less effective mm-hmm. at doing the keeping the the lactic acid bacteria happy. But mm-hmm. it's good enough to keep them happy, and you can have a vent. But what you mentioned is that when it's glazed, it means that some of the food doesn't stick there. Do you think there's anything in like a lot of what they're doing in beer, you know, in barrels, is the yeast live in the barrels, and when they put more beer in. You're kind of your you're getting your colony that is perfectly attuned to to what the people wanted to do, um, and mm-hmm. you're kind of reusing the yeast that way. And like I said, it's natural selection for producing that beer. Do you think there's anything? Is that any sort of idea in Korean kimchi that people are using specific ongi over and over again because they produce better kimchi? Or well. I haven't heard about that story, but there is some research about that. Okay. So if you, so I think like, like before coming, uh, coming back to the research, there's some people usually use ongi only for same purpose. So if you put kimchi last year and you're going to put another kimchi in this year for that ongi. So people like to just uh, assign each role for each ongi. I think there's some. I, I saw some scientific paper saying that if you put uh, if you ferment food in ongi, and you clean it and you wash out the surface, there's some bacteria still reside in the inside of the pores because you cannot wash away the inside of pores. It's too small. And there's so many pores inside. It's numerous pores there. So they break it down and you, they can extract the uh, the bacteria even after washing that surface. And which means if you're gonna put another food there, they're gonna involve in the next round of the fermentate, fermenting process. And they yeah. will increase the uh, bacteria count in the next round. Yeah, the, it, it gives a sort of a new effect, whether it is good or not. And that happens for Ongi because it is porous. There's some, there are so many rooms for bacteria yeah. hide, yeah, avoiding being washing down so yeah it's the exact same as yeah you see in in like i said in barrels and i also read recently i was just reading something about in some traditional brewing cultures they use clay pots and the thing is you put clay the pot. pot yeah you put the pot next to the other pots and it teaches it how to boil is what they, they were saying which is basically the <laughs> the yeast is just transferring across you know um yeah but then, but then you get like i said you know you get some pots that are presumably considered good and some that are considered bad because some will get infected so you can't use them anymore but others the the yeast or the bacteria is kind of producing exactly the taste you want or it's you know it, it's a, mm. a selected colony basically if you if you just use the pots you like yeah i think you can kind of guarantee a consistent result from the pot i guess yeah i would yeah, I would think so. I, I just was interested if, because I know people do that with beer, and I didn't know if that's a, 
you know, if that is a tradition or a folk tale or, you know, whatever in Korea that, you know, certain pots you don't have anything more to do with, yeah. but some you reuse because it's I, good. I, yeah. I never expected fermenting beers not in steel container. Do people ferment beers in some oak barrel and some clay yep. pots? Wow, yep. interesting. I'm, I've never seen that before. Clay pots, I haven't come across other than I know they do it in some traditional, I know uh, in Africa, for instance, some some traditional places, they still use clay pots. And I've been told mm. that they do that because then they'll use the last of the beer into the next pot and you're basically reselecting the yeast. But definitely in, um, like I said, in the lambics, in the spontaneous beers, they have them and they, they get the, the beer, they start fermenting it and then they finish the fermentation in the barrel. And those barrels will be used over generations and they presumably build up their little colonies of yeast in there that are perfectly selected. And I've been told by brewers that they can go and they can select this barrel will produce that flavor and, and all that, you know, that they can basically define the flavor. And that's presumably because they know what yeast has been kind of, you know, the, the characteristics of that yeast and what it produces. Um, and it's the same thing. I mean, wood obviously would be a porous material as well. So mm -hmm. that would be mm -hmm. perfect. So, so it, it's fascinating that when it comes to fermentation, even whether you're talking yeast or bacteria or food or beer, it's all the same, really. It, it just comes down to keeping the little bacteria or the yeast happy. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, so the, the, they both gen uh, generate CO2 uh, during the fermentation process. So, but the ongi has some kind of passive way to emit those gas. But I believe in fermenting beers. And I, when I, what, what I saw in the brewery, there is a big metal machine there having a, as a the beer container. And I see a mechanical valve. So I believe they do also control the internal CO2 level, but they do manually. Yeah. But I think there's kind of secrets in brewery, uh, which making uh, the better beer. So which level of CO2 is kind of optimal level yeah. to make a bad beer or something like that? I think it's kind of a whole similar story. Yeah. Well, like I said, though, the, the breweries are, uh, presumably it's the difference between, you know, the, the kimchi, the, the commercial one. It's most breweries, yeah, they have stainless steel tanks and they're very highly, you know, in this often cases, they're highly automated as well. And, you know, there, there's, mm. but there seems to be more or at least a trend among some brewers like and they're going back to that kind of more natural more small batch producing small batch beers and traditional um traditional equipment and you know like barrels like clay pots presumably and um is that something that's happening as well in kimchi like do you do you get artisanal kimchi i presume you do that's produced in ongi by old ways and not yeah i mean in in like a supermarket the old kimchi is made from factory, which is, which I, I guess is a stainless glass, like just like the the yeah. stainless container for the beer. But I, there's some small uh, market, uh, small populations which still like the kimchi from made of the ongi, and then there's some kind of some traditional restaurant advertising themselves. Oh, we ferment kimchi in our ongi. Right. Th that may be a good selling point for some people. And there's right. kind of small maniac of ongi still. Yeah. But the thing is, the ongi artisans, the, ongi, the tr traditional ongi makers, their number is kind of decreasing right now. And some the government is trying to protect them, like assigning them as a uh, un intangible cultural assets. But yeah. not many young people want to be a ongi maker right now. <laughs> right. So their number is decreasing. Yeah, that's that's the the recent story. Right. Yeah, it's the same thing. I mean, like like just come back to the beer like you it went all commercial went stainless steel and now it seems to be people are coming back to wanting to try the the older more traditional methods and beers and it's not just lager anymore you know they're they're trying and and yeast as well they're trying with different yeasts you know there are different um traditional yeasts like vikes and stuff like that which work at different temperatures and things like that so I think the artisanal thing is coming back probably in, in a lot of food and drink really because yeah, whether you can taste it or not, you like to think you could. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, 
but yeah, it, it's so. Um, yeah, so so what was your conclusion when you came out? Was this exactly what you expected to find when you were starting the the project, or did it surprise you in any way? Or well, I think it is it it, it is kind of expected research because uh, it is an old belief that the fermented food in Hongi is better than the fermented food in some hermetic jar, and Korean people has kind of uh, historically just educated that things. Because even though my title, the Ongi's permeability accelerates the kimchi fermentation, may sound new to foreign people, uh, but the Korean people already heard about that story before. But the yeah. thing is, the thing is, uh, most of the uh, previous research are done by biologists, which are uh, interested in the bacteria and some chemicals. What I did is measuring this, the gas this gas concentration and connecting that to that uh, the material 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 property of that ongi the pro the permeability and try to explain the reason why they they're better and to like co by connecting that the material property and the CO two level I think I tried to solve this uh, problem kind of very old problem in the eyes of mechanical engineer. And especially with with some fluid mechanics tools, I think okay. it's a new challenge and new finding that they connecting that uh, material property and some fluid mechanics theory to solve these kinds of very old question. Right. No, it's a fascinating project, and like I said, <laughs> the way it relates back into fermentation of any any product, it might it was like just of the beer, um, and you know how that how you you don't really often think about the like you said the mechanics of it you think about yeah temperature you think about mm -hmm. adding in ingredients and stuff but you know the the actual mechanics of the the product or of the you know the vessel they're maybe not often mm -hmm. thought about so it, it's interesting from that point you think of you know we've gone to a thing where it is more sterile you know even when you're fermenting you're doing it with selected bacteria you know at a commercial level you know or a yeast you there is no th there's very little where you mix ferment where you at least in beer there's very little where you're kind of letting anything to chance it's all about cleaning everything afterwards and while there's a mm -hmm. while there is now this trend in beer back to mixed fermentation you know wild yeasts like i said and um, spontaneous fermentation and things like that but that that's been the case in kimchi all along because you said you don't add any bacteria. It's it's automatically just on the cabbage, so it starts the fermentation mm -hmm. itself. So um, that that's interesting and in how I, I guess yeah, how we kind of maybe get back to some of that rather than the the purely sterile environment, which cuts off some of the cuts off some of the advantages. Um, but uh. Yeah, it, it, I, I thought it was a fascinating thing to do. I'm just going to see if anybody has any questions here. Does if you have any questions, put them in because we'll be finishing up soon. So um, if you if you have a question, just please do add it in. We have a few people watching us at the moment. Um, so I, I I don't know. So kimchi is it's never it's not going to go away from Korea and away from the sound of it. It's going to remain. It's it's a very yeah. I, I get I guess at least one one thousand years more maybe. Yeah. So even if it stays, even if it goes completely to um, stainless steel, it, it's not going away. But at that mm -hmm. stage, people will not be able to tell the difference because they won't have experienced the Yongi. But um, do you think there is there will be a, a trend back towards maybe like with research like this, back towards people wanting to to take it from you know the more traditional side? Or is Korea oh. just, just so much in the future now that it doesn't look back enough? Or Of course, there's some maniac. They want to uh, try something new and they want to buy ongi and they're, they want to ferment their own kimchi in their new ongi jar. But their demand will not be high, I guess. <laughs> okay. So, but the whole trend is not changing. But I guess uh, what I hope from my paper is that just trying to find a way to, a new way to understand the ancient culture. And also draw some attention for those ongi makers and uh, just introduce, uh, as a Korean, introduce my special culture 
which is very old. The Ongi is made of like several thousand years back then. And to uh, foreign people. And I think some people, uh, when, when I see the comments uh, in my articles, and there's some people saying that, oh, I gotta buy Ongi, I, I gotta try that. I, I gotta try, try that too in my home. I think that's kind of small movements is what I want. And I think very, I'm happy, I'm very happy to see those people interested, interested in, in this kind of new story and this kind of new tool, the Ongi, the Arthur merger, and to try their kind of interesting experiments there home. Right. Well, hopefully in some small way, we'll be able to help with that and help, um, help people go out and encourage. And maybe, maybe there will be a new generation of Ongi makers and there'll be some people will want to stay on because you again coming back you do see it now there's cooperages for barrels for beer and all of that they seem to be there's a new demand for coopers to make barrels seemingly um so maybe there will be for ongi makers as well yeah <laughs> all right well listen suan thanks a million for your for your time um really appreciate it um it was fascinating um looks like nobody had any questions um last chance if you have a question here people um, we do have a few people watching, but nobody has a question. Um, so, okay. so what we'll do is we leave it at that. Thanks again for your time. Um, and hey, this this will be on YouTube. So if you have any questions, you can pop them in the comments down there, and we'll maybe check up on them every so often and see if I pass them on. Um, so unless there's something specific I forgot to ask or I should have mentioned, was there? I think you done more than I expected. I think this is really very interesting. Uh, discussion about like coupling the beer and kimchi and I, 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 very, I was very interesting to talk about that and thank you for having this very interesting session okay well thank you like I said again thanks thanks for your research and for taking the time um yeah we'll be back next week um so do check out the other videos as well of course and all that um and um yeah see you next week <laughs>